I'm Noel Sharkey. I'm a professor of robotics and artificial intelligence at the University of Sheffield. Well, I've always loved science fiction since I was a kid, so it's been a real driving force for me. But academically, I was a psychologist to begin with. And then as soon as I could, I got into robotics. <laughs> because I like it so much, it's a cool thing to be involved with. My first robot was really very, very crude and I half made it myself. It just had a couple of wires and some sensors. And it was, had a, what do you call a machine learning algorithm on it. And what that meant was I had developed a program that could learn for itself. And so we drove the robot by remote control down the corridor, avoiding people. And then we released it and saw what it had learned and it came back up and avoided people. And it was just extraordinary to see. I've got a video of that very first thing. It's a very crude video, but it still inspires me a lot. I've taken a lot of different angles in robotics, um, you know, from, from machine learning to artificial intelligence. I first wanted to, first thing I wanted to do with robotics was to develop some language understanding because I thought that programs that do language understanding or try to understand language can't really understand it because they don't t partake in the world. So if you have a robot that actually goes around feeling things and doing things, then it should be able to understand language. Unfortunately, very soon after I started robotics, I got co so caught up in building them and all the electronics and all the things that you can do with a robot that I forgot all about the language. And 20 years later, I'm still not back there again. The funny thing about artificial intelligence is that it's mainly from the movies. I was a big science fiction fan. And when I first started reading about artificial intelligence, it was probably about 1978, 1979. And I really believed everything I read. And then I went off to America and worked at the Yale Artificial Intelligence Laboratories and I had access to all the best AI in the world. And that's when I got really disillusioned because I realised it was very fragile. You had these things that were supposed to be able to understand language and you got the comma in the wrong place and they just crashed out completely. And it's a very useful field in, in making things like how our cars run and all that sort of thing. But the idea that you're going to have an intelligence, a sentience, something like a human, is still so far away, it could be thousands of years, despite what anybody tells you. Artificial intelligence is maybe one of those things that you can't really talk about for the future. Uh, I don't see it going very far very quickly, but what I see is that in robotics, for instance, which is my main field in artificial intelligence, you're creating a kind of illusion. So you make machines that look as if they're intelligent, they seem as if they're intelligent, and if you make them well enough, people will be fooled into thinking they're intelligent. But I think that there's a difference between, say, Japan and the United States and the rest of the West. In Japan, they really want robots that look like beings, androids. But in the West, we actually like robots that are metallic and look like robots for some reason. And I prefer those too. So I don't want to be fooled by a robot. I want a robot to look like a robot so that I know what I'm talking to. It's actually very easy to deceive humans and make them think that something's alive. To so say my first robot was such a stupid little thing and it was mechanically failing. And so when it came up to me in the corridor, it would look as if it was trying to decide which way to turn around. And everybody used to say, oh, that robot's trying to make a decision about it. But I knew it was only two wires and it wasn't doing that. But it's the same with anything you look at, any sort of design, like if you look at cars, they have faces on them. In fact, if you take a, a, a newborn infant of a week old and you show it a colander, with two peas for eyes and a carrot, it will pay much more attention to that, be much more interested than if you shift the carrot and the peas around so they just look like random vegetables. So we're really attuned to faces. We really think things are, we know about puppets, for instance. Puppets have been going on for centuries. Your little teddy bear and things, which is just an inanimate object. Sorry for that, if anybody's uh, very attached to their teddy bear. But it looks like an, an inanimate object, yet we still feel that it's a personal thing. So you put a little bit of movement into that. Now the difference with a puppet is that you come to know as a child that somebody's been working that. Because I certainly remember my experience with a hand puppet and I was completely fooled by it. It was a little sooty puppet. And the man who was doing it with me left the room and left the puppet with me. And of course I was shaking it and trying to get it to speak and it wouldn't speak. So you quickly learn that it's just a puppet. But with a robot it's quite different because you could have the robot working when there's no one there. Even if it's remote controlled it can be controlled from another room. And so you could really deceive people into thinking this was a living thing. And part of it really is self-deception. We fantasise, we play, we deceive ourselves into thinking things. But I worry about it a little bit because there's a lot of talk about using robots, for instance, for childcare. 
And if you deceive young children into having a relationship with a robot, it could have very serious consequences for them and create psychological disorders. One of the things I'd like to see is, is raising the awareness of people about robotics and artificial intelligence because most people are exposed to it if they're interested in science fiction. Some people have no idea, but if they're interested in science fiction, they're mostly exposed to robotics and artificial intelligence through that. And one of the jobs I do is going around trying to explain to people what real AI and science fiction is like. And you can see the disappointment in their faces and they will argue against me because it's like telling kids that Santa Claus doesn't exist, really. It's that kind of feeling to it. And I'd like to see a lot more responsiveness from you know, from responsible, sorry, a lot more uh, teaching from responsible people, not even teaching, just discussion and letting people see what ro real robots are like. And this really helps my field because I've been with roboticists so often and they will do something like they've got this great new algorithm for avoiding obstacles, which is still very difficult, would you believe? And they bring it out, they have the robot down and they show that it drives around and avoids obstacles. And you can see all these people just looking at that and thinking, is that all it does? because they think already that robots can think and talk and, and do all sorts of things. One of the things I've been involved in was a, was a project called Visions. I was one of the applicants in it. And we went round to different uh, science centres and they brought young people in from 16 to 18 years old and it was their conference. All I had to do was inform them for half an hour, didn't give my opinions, told them the state of the field. They chose what areas to work in and they spent the whole day in the conference discussing it and developing their own ideas and they could call me in again and ask me questions. So I acted as a consultant. And I found that by the end of that day, they had all really shifted their views and had a much more realistic idea. And you don't want to crush people's dreams because in actual fact, you've got all this science fiction stuff, but what people need to know is that we're on the brink now of real creativity with robotics. And if your head's full of science fiction, you'll never really come to your own ideas. There are so many off-the-shelf components now. You can buy all the electronics. You can even get them pre-programmed. So it's, a lot of the work now is a matter of your own creativity, putting all these pieces together and coming up with your own ideas. The most exciting robot I've ever worked with is a tricky one because I, I know so many people and they might be offended if I, if I talk about it. But the two most advanced robots I've worked with were the Asimo robot by Honda. Uh, let me say about that one first. But it's not quite what people think it is either. I mean, it's a beautiful robot. It's, it's definitely incredibly well engineered, and it should be. It cost $80 million to develop, a lot of money. And you see it in television, you see it walking about. And I've done a TV program where we talk to each other and we walk about and it chats to me and it climbs stairs and everything else. But what people don't realize is that it wouldn't have matter what I said to it, it would have still said the same things in response. And also its walking was exactly measured because at one point the director said to me, uh, sorry, the director of the, the, the video said to the programmers, could we have it just uh, walk over this way a little bit because, you know, we want uh, the professor standing under this light. And they said, well, you have to give us a couple of hours to reprogram it because they were going around with tape measures and measuring it. So it's not autonomous at all. It's pre-programmed, it looks great, it walks great, and the big thing about that robot is it cracked walking, humanoid walking. And, you know, we can all walk, and so it seems very simple, but it's actually a very, very difficult robotics problem. Um, the other one I've worked with that's a very advanced robot is called Reem B, and it's owned by the United Arab Emirates Royal Family. It's a young prince, is a big Star Trek fan. And so he spent a few million pounds getting all these really good engineers to build this robot for him. And I went there and demonstrated it to them because I could say it in natural language. And it could do the sort of things that Asimov robot could do. It could climb stairs, it could lift weights, but it could walk around on its own. And its sensors were in its feet. It had laser sensors in its feet so it could walk around on its own. And what it could do was it could navigate. Now navigation is another thing. I'm in this room and I can look around this room and I know where I am in the room. Robots don't do that very well. We're still at a very low stage of that. When you see these robots on a stage, the stage has all been flattened nicely and it's all very exactly measured out. Stairs are all exactly the same height. But a real robot will start walking around the room and you use what you call odometry, like you've got in your bicycle. But one little slip, one little move in the wrong direction and 10 or 15 steps out later, it's out by about 90 degrees. So it's a really, really difficult problem, and that's the kind of problem we're trying to solve now. So even the most advanced robots don't do that.
If you want to really get started in robotics, the thing to do is get a little kit. I'm not set trying to sell Lego, but Lego make this kit called Mindstorms, and anybody can program it really. It's very, very easy. It's like a little jigsaw set. And when you when you get tired of that, you download a program called Not Quite C, which is also very simple, but it allows it to do an awful lot. And you construct these little robots very easily, and they really teach you an awful lot. You learn very quickly what the issues are, what the control issues are, how about navigation, etc. I think that one of the things that in, in robotics is we try to make every robot as simple as possible. So even though I talk about these big, grand, complex robots, they're only as complex as they need to be. We have an expression which is ki the KISS philosophy, which is keep it simple, stupid. So you want to keep them really, really simple and really, really stupid. And that's what made the big difference in domestic robots, for instance, because the founder fathers of artificial intelligence wanted to make robots that were like humans. So they had big vision systems on them, cameras, and cameras can't actually see anything. All cameras do is take an image and put it to a program. Then this program they tried to make like a human so it would reason, it would think about where it was going, it would make plans, and then it would move. And those robots moved one meter, spent 15 minutes looking around the room, moved one meter. So it would take several hours to get across the room. Then in the 1980s people said, let's just go for the very simple route. Let's put on infrared sensors. And they're like what you've got in your house alarm. So very, very simple sensors. And all they do is detect an object and tell you how far it is away. So you just have something that will avoid objects and move around. So now you've got a vacuum cleaner that avoids the walls, avoids the furniture, and just moves in a preset routine but the preset routine gets broken up because it sees a wall or, or, or a piece of furniture and it just keeps going around and uh, cleaning all the dirt up. So keeping robots very, very simple is the way forward for, for all robotics nowadays. I think at this point in time would be a great time to get into robotics uh, as a career because there's, there's a real proliferation of robotics, particular service robots. Now, there, there have been something like there are a million and a half normal industrial robots on the planet at the minute, and, and service robots started five, ten years ago, and there are now five and a half million already and 17 million predicted over the next three years. So if you were doing A-levels now, to start now in five years' time, you'd be coming into a real field. And the other thing about robotics is you can come at it from any approach. It's multidisciplinary. And if you're somebody who likes learning a lot, it's continually puzzles. I can't be all these fields, but I have to know a bit about electronics, about computer science, psychology, and all these different aspects and all these different fields. So the best thing to do is to take a degree in electrical engineering or control engineering or even biology or psychology, and you can come into robotics. But get your own kit, work on it, play with it, learn about computing, and then study a subject like one of the ones I've said.